Welcome back. We have a very out-of-this-world tale for you. We're going to be talking about Gene Roddenberry and what his inspiration for Star Trek was and where he got his philosophies and where he got his ideas from. And like I said, it's out of this world, literally. It goes beyond just that Gene Roddenberry was a proud atheist and a proud humanist. Okay, we need to go back to the 50s. In a private research laboratory in Glen Cove, Maine, called the Round Table Foundation, American Army physician and parapsychologist Andreas Poharich, also known as Henry Poharich, set up in 1948 to research the paranormal. Okay, and many, many different famous scientists and paranormal occult researchers and things all participated in this round table foundation thing in december 1952 Paharich brought into his laboratory an indian mystic named dr dg vinod who began to channel the nine and they channeled this group of beings that they called the council of nine Alistair Crowley and Anton LaVey both spoke of a group of evil spirits, entities collectively called the Nine. Crowley wrote, quote, I serve my great master Satan and the August Council of Nine. One day I was up in the upper Westchester County area visiting with the former vice president of the United States, Henry Wallace, who was a good friend of mine. We did a lot of agricultural experiments together. And we got stuck a little bit on the statistics of an experiment we were running, so I missed the train. I was going to take back to New York City. And uh, I missed it by about two hours, and I did have an appointment in New York City. So he rushed me to the nearest town, which is Pleasantville, New York, known for Reader's Digest, put me on a train there. I got on the train. And I sat down, kind of running all day, you know. And the last guy gets on the train, he comes away, and it's this Dr. Vina. He sits next to me, he says, oh, he says, oh, time for, you know, the Indians talk a little high-pitched voice, and say, oh, time we ought to get together, right? And said, you know, I guess so we've been caught up with. Make a long story short, I invited him up to uh, uh, my laboratory in Maine, which is near Rockland, and he came in by plane, one of my colleagues had picked him up. He walked into the house, which is a very famous Stanford White place, huge, and walked into the library and sat down, and without giving us any warning, went into trance and started speaking. We are nine principles and forces, personalities that we wish, and we planned this to the altar of the blah, 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 blah. And they start t- telling us about who they were and what the history, and if they're interested in helping us to further evolution, okay, that's how it all got started. And uh, so we got excited about this because it seemed like very high quality information, particularly the mathematics, which some of it to this day we have not solved. My dad almost 30 years later. In the months before Dr. Vinod returned to India, a group met regularly to hear the Nines channeled wisdom. Never known for their modesty, the Nine proclaimed themselves to be God, stating, quote, God is nobody else than we together, the Nine Principles of God. Okay, we're going to get later on to more quotes from these beings that were channeling through this Dr. Vinod, and then as time went on, they used different channelers. Okay, so then Paharich was in Mexico studying mushrooms. and The pilot says he'll be ready soon, John. And last, our forever optimistic, Dr. Andre Puharish, who wrote the astounding book, The Sacred Mushroom. Dr. Puharish's book brought us here in the first place, and in it, he explains how the mushroom seems to have an incredible effect on the power of extrasensory perception. Incredible is the word. We're here for some very specific purposes. And he, he met up with these other people that were channeling, and they were getting messages from the Nine, these same beings. Later on in the 70s, Puharich met and discovered this Yuri Geller, 
who was the guy that claimed he could bend the spoons with his mind and all this stuff, and he became a little superstar and everything. And Dr. Andrea Puharic was the first American scientist to study Geller. Geller from friends in Israel who know about my interest in parapsychology. And I spent a week with him. And he was very cooperative, I must say, and uh, I set up a little laboratory in Tel Aviv that friends let me have part and got equipment. And in a week, I was quite convinced that Ori really was extraordinary. And uh, from then on, I started organizing a major research program around Ori, which, you know, is still going on. Fairly mature now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Was that the first time you'd ever seen uh, psychokinesis? No, I'd actually... Uh, seen different levels of psychokinesis in 1953 I saw under laboratory conditions materialization of objects I was studying a Hindu by the name of Dr. Vinod at that time and subsequently I saw dematerialization um, really he's a fraud when it comes to the spoon stuff but just you know as we're going to talk about it we, what I what I personally think is just that a lot of the stuff I believe it's real in the spiritual realm, but there's also an aspect and a side to it where the powers that be are pro- pushing it and promoting it, and they want it put into the culture and the consciousness of all the people in the country and the different countries around the world, and they want it to be perceived as real, and they want you to believe that you know these powers and everything, and these that what they're calling them aliens from other planets and other other worlds and things. They want everyone to believe in that because they're preparing everyone for a future event, let's say. And it's called predictive programming. Um, you know, and there's minor version, more minor predictive programming all throughout Star Trek too. You know, you have... The phones, the cell phones, the communicators... Uh, everything with the doors, the scanners, you know, all the medical things. Just a lot of predictive programming there. Because they collaborated with NASA, but definitely on a large scale, predictive programming that these beings from outside are going to help us evolve spiritually. And through Geller, the Nine alerted Poharich to his life's mission which was to use Geller's talents to alert the world to an imminent mass landing of spaceships that would bring representatives of the Nine. Okay, so then Geller became like a big superstar, and he bowed out. He fell out. He got away from this group. So Puharich had to go on and find other channelers to get his messages from these beings. So he joined up with this wealthy race car, well-known race car driver, Sir John Whitmore, and Florida-based psychic and healer Phyllis Schlemmer. And Phyllis Schlemmer starts channeling these beings, unclean spirits. We're going to study that from the Bible coming up later. We're going to define what all this is. But right now I'm just telling you what they did. Data being received. (laughs) Well, Andrea was really trying to find out uh, the source for... Uh, who he was working with. And who was Andrea? Just and, for the oh, Dr. Andrea Puharic. Okay. He discovered Ori Geller, Peter Herkos, uh, many different mediums and psychics and so forth. And uh, was researching for many, many years people in our field. And suddenly a tape began to wind, voices came on it, it was, uh, they were saying who they were, which was whom Andrea was looking for for many, many years, called the Nine, and the directions were given, the tape was turned off, and then it totally disappeared. What do you think caused the tape to be erased? I think it just dematerialized. I think they gave the message, but they did not want where it could be passed on to others at this time. And also for Andre, it was proof that this was the nine, because they could do that. Is there a transcription of that message? No. No? No, unfortunately. So who were the privileged ones who were able to listen to it? A small gathering of people, just... I don't want to mention names. No, that's okay. 
I've worked with Dr. Andrea Puharic for about 25 years. Uh, the nine entered our life or my life in the late 60s. Uh, Puharic uh, recognized who they were and um, I do deep trance. I go into an unconscious state, have no memory, and these <laughs> beings speak through me. Uh, or one of them does. One of them calls himself the spokesperson, and he says his name is Tom. Uh, I lived in Israel for many years. I grew organic fruit over there, and what I and I never did know Hebrew. But when I moved to Israel, what I found out is that word, which it's not exactly Tom as we know it, but the way it's like Tom, uh, is the Hebrew word for innocence. Uh, so maybe that's who they are. I mean, they come across like that. Um, no big shocker there, because these things have been around since creation. They are ancient beings, that's for sure. But they're not aliens. They're devils. They're unclean spirits. Demons is another word, but that word isn't really in the King James Bible. We try and stick with devils, unclean spirits, evil spirits. And we're going to look at all those terms later in the Bible and show you how they're all the same thing. And that's what's going on. There's, 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 there's God, there's angels, there's the devil, and there's his angels, his evil angels. That's what we're dealing with. That's what Gene got his motivation from. And it's not good. Canadian billionaire Edgar Bronfman's family, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, CIA MK Ultra program, New Age authors Lyle Watson, J.J. Hurtak, Richard Hoagland, murderer Ira Einhorn, the unicorn killer, film and television producer Gene Roddenberry. Lab 9, they called it. Gene Roddenberry became part of that circle in 1974 and 1975. Roddenberry wrote a script for an entire summer under the influence of a psychic entitled The Nine about a group of aliens who would invade the Earth and establish a new kingdom. And it wasn't picked up. But he still couldn't sell these... He had these really weird screenplays he was developing for these beings. After meeting with this group and listening to these channeled messages from these unclean spirits for two or three years straight. And uh, then he kind of took over his mindset even further. He was an atheist before. He was a humanist before. He mocks and scoffs at God. The man is a blasphemer. But this is when he really began to pick up speed and this became like his little mission. And it's even further in with all the movies, the films are when he really begins, you know, even further with these concepts. But even in the show, they're always running into these beings that are godlike and then ruining, you know, showing they're not really gods. They're just powerful aliens and it's misunderstood. And then mankind triumphs over them and shows them up and Captain Kirk beats them. And what is it you want? You will worship me as your fathers did before you. You want to play God and call yourself Apollo. That's your business. But you're no God to us, mister. I said you would worship me. <laughs> Mister, you want worshippers? We've got enemies. Fire those faces. That's an order, Mr. Spock. All phaser banks. Fire. All banks maintain fire rate. Maintaining, sir. you a 
as a father loves his children. Did I ask so much? We've outgrown you. You asked for something we can no longer give. You were right. Athena. You were right. The time has passed. There is no room for gods. But it was Vol who put the fruit on the trees, caused the rain to fall. Vol cared for us. You learn to care for yourselves with our help. And there's no trick to putting fruit on trees. You might even enjoy it. You learn to build for yourselves, think for yourselves, work for yourselves, and what you create is yours. That's what we call freedom. You'll like it a lot. And you learn something about men and women, the way they're supposed to be. Caring for each other, being happy with each other, being good to each other. That's what we call love. You'll like that too, a lot. You and your children. What are children? Uh, little ones look like you. They just go on the way you're going, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I want you to hear this. Captain, I'm not at all certain we did the correct thing on Gamma Triangle 6. We put those people back on a normal course of social evolution. I see nothing wrong in that. Captain, you are aware of the biblical story of Genesis. Yes, of course, I'm aware of that. Adam and Eve tasted the apple, and as a result, were driven out of paradise. Precisely, Captain. And in a manner of speaking, we have given the people of Vile the apple the knowledge of good and evil, if you will, as a result of which they too have been driven out of paradise. Doctor, do I understand him correctly? Are you casting me in the role of Satan? Not at all, Captain. Is Satan. there anyone on this ship who even remotely looks like Satan? I am not aware of anyone who fits that description, Captain. You know, Mr. Spock, I didn't think you would. written in another character who wasn't even human, an alien who looked like Satan himself, complete with pointy ears. The concept right there, you know, of anti-God, and they've always had that from the start. Okay, many of the concepts found their way into the early Star Trek movies and the next generation and Deep Space Nine, Deep Space Nine. And in the quotes from this beings, Tom and the Nine and all that, they they say, where are they from? And they answer and say, deep space. I mentioned Phyllis Schlemmer. This is from her actual website, The Only Planet of Choice. Don't recommend you go there because she's selling this satanic book that she wrote that's all based on the channeling of the Nine, the Council of Nine. So did you know, this is right off of her site, did you know that Gene Roddenberry researched background material for his Star Trek series with a distinguished international group using a medium? This group was comprised of scientists, doctors, teachers, ambassadors, athletes, and filmmakers from several countries. The medium, Phyllis V. Schlemmer, was an internationally known psychic slash healer of unusual ability. She was a colleague of Dr. Andriha Puharich, who recognized the nine universal beings who came through her when Phyllis was in a trance. The nine are a group of wise universal beings. Devils. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> I just got a drink. Universal beings. Where did I leave off? When Roddenberry asked where the Nine came from, their answer was, the zone you call cold in deep space. Sound familiar? Deep Space Nine became a hugely popular television sequel to Star Trek. For over 30 years, Phyllis, the Nine, and this multinational group have collaborated to investigate, among other deep questions, the origins of man. Now, I mean, you know, sound like a conspiracy theory? You know, over 30 years, they're they're collaborating with these devils and demons, you know, these unclean evil spirits to make, you know, 
all kinds of messages come out into the culture because that's what the nine wanted. They wanted their message propagandized as Roddenberry said in his own words. He wanted to propagandize everyone with his, with his philosophies that came from uh, the nine. I saw in this show a chance to uh, say things I wanted to say and propagandize my own ideas. And, and that's good. Writers should do that. All artists should do that. They should boldly say what they think. The result is a remarkable book. Oh, The Only Planet of Choice, Essential Briefings from Deep Space, a unique document of transcripts of conversations with the Nine. Well, that'd be a real satanic thing to read. I don't recommend it. Creepy. Just, just so creepy. So creepy. Now, here's a little bit of an excerpt from one of the transcripts from one of their little channeling sessions there. Somebody named John, probably John Whitmore. Yeah, John Whitmore. He's asking the questions. John says, We are likely to be asked in the future the question, What is God? Tom says, What is God to you? It is unified, infinite intelligence, supported with pure love, and it grows with pure love. It is absolute faith and absolute love. That is God. If you have doubts that we exist, we do understand. But remember that in each of you there is God. And in each of us there is God. Because God is love and love is with us all. And you know, you, you could become as gods. like Kind of like Satan said in the Garden of Eden. Let's look a little closer at uh, Gene Roddenberry. I have this printed out from the British Humanist World Humanist Association or something. I'll have to put it on the screen. I Honestly, I forgot. It's some big humanist foundation thing where they praise all the famous humanists that spread their atheism. Gene Roddenberry, creator and executive producer of the television series Star Trek, believed that human beings can solve problems through reason and cooperation, that there is no need to turn to superstition or religion for help, that human understanding and intelligence will help us to develop and progress, and that the universe is a natural wonder waiting to be explored and understood. This philosophy shines through the many adventures in Star Trek. Yeah, it sure does. Although Roddenberry's family were churchgoers, he became an atheist when a teenager. If you read science fiction, the more you read it, the more you realize that you and the universe are part of the same thing. Science still knows practically nothing about the real nature of matter, energy, dimension, or time, and even less about those remarkable things called life and thought. But whatever the meaning and purpose of this universe, you are a legitimate part of it. And since you are part of the all that is, part of its purpose, there is more to you than just this brief speck of existence. You are just a visitor here in this time and this place, a traveler through it. What a difference that makes. As a traveler here, it no longer crushes you that this world is not always fair or orderly or understandable. Your passport allows you to fix what you can, to love, to refuse to take part in ugliness. But meanwhile, you are delighted that this is such a varied, colorful, exciting place. As a traveler, you're not here to judge, but to experience. You begin to feel a new affection for the life forms here. You no longer feel threatened that some may be greater or lesser than you. It's only important that you've been given this marvelous opportunity to enjoy this trip, to learn from it, and in my case, write about it. Perhaps you know where I'm leading. On a trip like this, and it is a trip, its loveliness is not in the sameness of people and things, but in their incredible variety. Eventually, this led me to the Star Trek statement, Idik, infinite diversity from infinite combinations. Thank whatever created us, we are different, each of us and everything around us. To the end of time, if it ever does end, no combination will ever come up quite the same. That's quite a travel package. All of this is how Star Trek began. 
And it's also something of what it's about. I am an alien. <laughs> and so are you. And yet, and this is the loveliest thing of all, somehow we're also part of each other and part of everything that is. Do you think mankind needs saving of some sort? Oh, I, I think my own philosophy is uh, that uh, mankind has within himself what he needs. I, 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 I rather think that uh, uh, whatever God is, we are all a part of it. Some of the values Gene Roddenberry expressed in Star Trek include cooperation and mutual encouragement, peaceful problem solving. It's so peaceful on Star Trek. They never start anything, that's the thing, though. They always try to reason with the evil god being or whoever they're fighting. But, you know, then they have to... You know. Kirk and Picard do not start fights. They try to talk first and work out peaceful solutions. At the same time, they are firm about their right to defend themselves against aggression. Equal dignity and respect for every life form. Nothing is automatically considered worthless or inferior. No dogma or doctrine. Except for hating God. Personal beliefs are respected. Unless you're a Christian. But dogma is not imposed on anyone as if it were the one and only truth. Yeah, because you can't have any absolute truth. I'm absolutely sure that there's no such thing as absolute truth. That's kind of how they view it. You know, they're absolutely against absolute truth. Like Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. You know, that would be an absolute statement. So they're absolutely against that. Reliance on science to find facts, but enjoyment of human emotions, spirituality, and intuition. Oh. You can enjoy spirituality, you know, maybe like contacting, I don't know, evil demonic beings from deep space. <laughs> That's spirituality. Now, here's a quote from Roddenberry about his, one of his early movie scripts that they rejected. His first attempt in May of 1975, he submitted to studio had Barry Diller on June 30th of that year. Here's a quote. I handed them a script and they turned it down, Roddenberry stated. It was too controversial. It talked about concepts like, who is God? In it, the Enterprise meets God in space. God is a life form. And I wanted to suggest that there may have been, at one time in a human beginning, an alien entity that early man believed was God and kept those legends. Well, that would explain it. Then you could just sin all you want. You're not accountable to anyone. It's it God idea. It was just some alien out there. Why not believe in that? But believing in the Bible would be foolish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, there are claims that the New Jersey complex of Lab 9 burned to the ground in 1979 amidst a fury of alleged accusations of child-related abuse. Poharich, he worked for the CIA, too. He, he did uh, MK Ultra mind control stuff with children and you know they called them star kids and they had like you know they would tell these kids they were special but then they would lock them in a faraday cage and blast it with uh electricity and uh traumatize the kids trauma-based mind control <clears throat> Here's some water i told you this was going to be you know boldly go where no mooning video has gone before oh i see it yeah, but they did that. You know, they had the kids locked in cages. And uh, some of the survivors that have come out actually uh, against Puharich and told what he did to them, no extent could probably describe what was done to these poor children. They lock them in Faraday cages and blast them with electricity while they 
you know, trying to get him to do telekinesis and uh, Lord only knows how many unclean spirits were going on with this. All this weird occult, paranormal, satanic garbage that they did. And they did a lot of it to children. So the place burned down. God's judgment. They did all kinds of other things like remote viewing for the CIA and all kinds of these paranormal stuff. Okay? And the guy is a complete psycho, Perharich. And, you know, of course, he met with Pope John Paul II. Probably get, you know, give him a status report or get some extra accolades, you know, for all his wonderful work. For humanity. We're really something, we humans are. In the Deep Space Nine plot, um, there's these Bejoran wormhole beings or something. Um, there's nine, nine Bejoran orbs. The wormhole as home to celestial beings they call the prophets, who are revered as gods by the Bejorans. There's nine of them. You know, just, I mean, you know, come on. It's this conspiracy. Just because everything is about nine. And, oh, yeah, and then Starship Enterprise, too. You know, NCC-1701. Uh, well, it's kind of funny because in the occult, they do this, you know, and you really were supposed to add them up. So 1701, you know, adds up to nine. Yeah, it's just nothing there. I mean, it's just another nine. Come on. It's just nine. Everywhere, no matter what. Oh, yeah. Right. So, um... So, Star Trek, ultimately, it provides a humanistic view of mankind. It's in the future. Religion has been, like, you know, basically done away with. Uh, it's seen as primitive. It's seen as um, superstition. Like it or not, we have rekindled the Mentarkin's belief in the Overseer. And are you saying that this belief will eventually become a religion? It's inevitable. And without guidance, that religion could degenerate into inquisitions, holy wars, chaos. Horrifying. Dr. Barron, your report describes how rational these people are millennia ago. They abandoned their belief in the supernatural. Now you are asking me to sabotage that achievement, to send them back into the dark ages of superstition and ignorance and fear? No! First thing I want to read is Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay, if you find out that something like this is based on a satanic conspiracy that's being brought into the world by evil spirits, devils, unclean spirits. What can the righteous do? You should have nothing to do with it. And all this is founded on these principles. Even the fact that the man is an atheist and he believes in propagandizing the youth with his philosophy. I don't need your philosophy. I'm a born-again Christian. I don't want your philosophy. I don't need it scoffers, mockers. It's worldly. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We, we need to avoid the scoffers. Avoid it. Proverbs 4, 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Keep away from it. It's dangerous. All right? Psalm 119. Back into the Psalms here. Because we need to get the mind of God. 
Psalm 119, verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Praise God. Psalm 119, verse 36. Incline my ear unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. It's all vanity, okay? And it's all lies. It's all based on lies from these evil spirits. Okay, Deuteronomy 18, 11. I'm just going to... We just need to go over a little bit about what these beings really are, who they really are. Um, they're not ancient, wise beings that want to help guide humanity into the next stage of evolution and spirituality. They're not uh, benevolent beings that want to help us. They're liars. They're evil servants of Satan. They're enemies of the Most High God. And that's who Gene listened to his whole life. Deuteronomy 18, 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. It's all an abomination to God. Consulting with familiar spirits. Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, God hates contacting these evil spirits. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. That's what this is, Phyllis Schlemmer, going into a trance and getting channeling messages from the nine. They're evil angels. They're fallen angels. They're referred to as devils, unclean spirits, evil spirits. And we're going to see all those words used here in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ has power over them. Matthew 9, 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him, to Jesus, a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying it, has, it was never so seen in Israel. Mark 5, 8 through 9. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. That's funny. You have one unclean spirit answering. He's kind of a spokesperson for a bigger group. Huh. Kind of reminds me of Tom from the Nine. Council of Nine, yeah. Matthew twenty-five forty-one. Then shalt thou, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, and that's what these beings are. Tom might even be Satan. I don't know. They're liars. But it's either Satan, or one of his angels, one of his devils, evil spirits. Luke 7, 21. And in that same hour, 
he cured, it's talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Praise the Lord. Luke 8, 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Is it evil spirits, devils, same thing. You know, this is real stuff. That's the sad thing is all these trekkers and trekkies, they actually have a faith-based religion in all this. They love to talk about the humanism, 50 years of humanism, and Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek and everything is so wonderful. It's their religion. And they believe in all this boldly go where everything beyond and everything they they're into the idea with the ufos and all that stuff is satanic occult activity that that is spiritual activity there's ufos and stuff like that it's a deception taking over the world a lot of that stuff is real but it's not aliens it's not aliens that are in the other dimension it's angels, God's angels, and it's the devil's angels, the evil angels that followed him when he rebelled against God. They're unclean spirits. They're devils. And that's where Roddenberry got his whole world view from, from the Council of Nine. Even if Gene Roddenberry never met John Whitmore and Phyllis Schlemmer and Andreas Puharich, the psycho doctor, even if he never contacted with the Council of Nine and listened to their channeled devil messages, it's still Antichrist. And this is why. 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. The man was an atheist and a proud humanist. That's the spirit of Antichrist. He was a God-hater. He spent his career promoting plots and shows and ideas of mankind triumphing over God-like beings. They make a mockery of the God of creation. But I want people to consider that these forces, these beings are real. The Council of Nine, and there's much, many more than nine. <laughs> They're very active in the world. Satan is called the god of this world. He's doing a lot in this world. And the entertainment industry is his pulpit. The TV is his preaching. The movie theater is his evangelism. The radio station is his sermon. I don't care if it's country or rap or hip hop or rock or metal or jazz or what you're what you're listening to. It has a spiritual side to it. Ephesians six twelve, for we wrestle not against the flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So I thank you for watching, and I pray that you can share this with people if there's a lot of big Star Trek fans out there. I know I'm going to get hate mail, and I'm going to, you know, the world hates Christ. The world hates God's Word, but this is for those who have ears to hear. And I'll be praying that God can use this to wake some people up. And, and I thank you for watching.